Assalamu alaikum. We'll go ahead and continue for our third and last uh, lecture for the night. Sheikh Kamal has been dubbed the Black Belt of Dawah with decades of experience in the Dawah scene. Sheikh Kamal combines his groundbreaking teaching style with his own dash of humor, certain to leave students feel at ease and entertained, but above all skilled and empowered. Sheikh Kamal is known best for his workshop, How to Give the Shahada in 10 Minutes, a six-hour workshop designed to empower students in the art of Dawah. His lectures and online videos have in popular fame a positive impact among Muslims and non-Muslims. Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world, attracting people from all walks of life with its message of peace, justice, and compassion. For many, the attraction, attraction to Islam is strong, but they struggle to find answers to their questions about their religion and its practices. In this lecture, Sheikh Kamal will provide a comprehensive introduction to Islam and help attendees understand the core beliefs and practices that make this faith so compelling. Please welcome Sheikh Kamal al Makki. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-ameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd. Why Islam? All right. So before I get into that, uh, I want to tell you something interesting that happened about, about 12 years ago. So, and, and this is, I'm not going to give you any definitive answer in the end. I just want you to, to let this simmer for a moment. So about 12 years ago, this piece of news came out that said every year, 6 million Muslims in Africa leave Islam and they become Christian. All right. Now when this piece of news came out, all the du'at people involved in da'wah, they split into two groups. One group said, I believe it. The other group said, I don't believe it. Why? Because the source was the CIA. Like, how can you trust the CIA? They're the last people you can trust. <laughs> Even the FBI is better than the CIA. <laughs> so, so that's why this happened. Now, the group that believed it, they said, you have, for example, <laughs> the Vatican. You have Christian groups from around the world, in Europe, U United States, excuse me. <coughs> they pump millions of dollars into the poorest continent on the planet. Can you just assume nothing happens and every year they keep pumping millions and nobody becomes Christian at all? Very poor people and they need blankets and food and they're told Jesus loves you and people smile at them and give them more blankets and food and nothing's going to happen? So they said it's plausible. Now others said well, maybe six million is too much, but look. Um, so it, there, there are huge numbers of people and you can argue that they barely knew Islam. They were Muslim by name. This guy's Muslim because his name's Abdullah. He's Muslim because his name's Ahmed. And that's about it. They don't know much about their deen. And they're poor people. And yes, there are cases of, of villages that become Christian because they wanted the food and blankets or, or help after the hurricane or tsunami or mudslide. And uh, there's that funny old story about the village that became Christian. And then they said, okay, you know, what can we do for you? They said, take us to Hajj, you know. So... <laughs> There are all kinds of things happening here. But uh, there were, I met some du'at in Africa when I was in South Africa. And they were telling me that one of them said, you know, my father went to this African country, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And everybody's Muslim, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. He said he went last year. He could barely find anyone to say wa alaikum salam when he said salam alaikum. And then I heard from other du'at that Christian missionaries were building Churches that look like mosques. So from the outside, shukran, katta alf khair, mashallah. Like dhuq, mashallah. Shukran. I appreciate it very much. Um, they said they built churches that look like mosques. So you see what looks to be a masjid, and then you walk in, and then Jesus is Lord and He loves you too. Right? Now, I, I wanted the picture of that, but I asked uh, a good friend of mine, you may have heard of this guy, his name is Mufti Mink. I personally asked him this, and he was like, yes, it is true. They, are, they built churches looking like mosques. So it's, 
it's kind of not realistic to assume no, nothing is happening with all this missionary work and all these millions of dollars pumped into the poorest place. So then people start to challenge this idea, is Islam really the, fast, the world's fastest growing religion? And they come up with a number of things. So some people believe that it is the fastest growing religion through, in the West through birth rate and immigration. Because it makes you feel like, you know, oh, mashallah, we're doing a lot of da'wah. No, we're just having a lot of babies, all right? And <laughs> we're bringing relatives over. <laughs> so it's the fastest growing religion in that sense. Because they say the fastest growing, well, this was a couple of years ago, the fastest growing religious group in America, the Mormons. The Mormons work like crazy. Every one of them gives two years of his life for missionary work. And during these two years, now they changed the rules a little bit. They were not even allowed to contact their family. No letters, nothing. Just focus. Do you understand how hard the Mormons work? It's not even funny. Like they will learn a language in two months. And I mean really learn the language where they can speak fluently. So a Mormon will study in America, will study Portuguese. Then he'll go to Brazil and he will be able to give da'wah in Portuguese. Not just, hi, how are you? My name is Jonathan. No, like full da'wah. I mean, they're so effective that our friends, the CIA again, the CIA came to them and said, how do you do it in two months? Teach us. We got spies to train and stuff. How do you teach people in two months? That's how hard they work. It's amazing. And you're telling me they're doing all this hard work. And we just kick back and talk about how Islam will rise. And then we're still growing faster than them. So many people, so there are some du'at who did not believe that. They said, yeah, it's just through immigration and through childbirth, through birth rate, that we're the fastest growing in the West. Others believe that Islam is growing, the fastest growing religion was uh, like uh, perpetuated by those who want to create an alarmist mentality. They want to scare everyone. You know, it's the same people who, oh, the Sharia is coming. No, it's not. No, it's not coming, all right? When it comes to Egypt and, uh, and Sudan and Algeria, then you can maybe worry about it crossing the... Uh, <laughs> it's not coming. <laughs> I used to, just on a side note, I knew one guy, this was in Virginia, and he used to always say, you know, I don't understand why Muslims don't believe the Sharia is coming to America. Like, why would I bring it to America? Like, I've got a whole bunch of Muslim countries. Don't you think I would put them at the top of the list? Try to bring the Sharia to a people who are not Muslim makes no sense. But in his mind, he thinks that a guy's gonna climb up on Capitol Hill with a bucket of green paint, paint that dome green, then a black guy's gonna climb up, make the adhan, and that's it. But then this is the funny part. He goes, he says this. I don't understand why every intelligent person I talk to about this disagrees with me. And that's a good marker in life. When all the smart people disagree with you, <laughs> you should know that uh, I should change my viewpoint. I am probably wrong. <laughs> anyway, so they were just, uh, I just wanted to start off with that interesting discussion. And then the third uh, theory says that Islam is the fastest growing religion. This is per also perpetuated so that we relax and we kick back and say, despite all the negativity in the media and in the news and in the movies, we are still the fastest growing religion. And I don't have, we don't have to do anything, it's the fastest growing. And that's why, for the, it could explain why for the most part we just kick back. We don't tell anybody about Islam. We barely tell our neighbors about it because, hey, no matter what, it's still the fastest growing. I don't have a definitive answer to that, but I just wanted to put that out there and then you can come up with uh, your own opinion. I didn't even state mine really, but just food for thought there. So, Islam. Islam is Allah's final revelation and it is the safest position. There's no doubt about it. It's the safest position. Because the Jews believed in everybody from Adam, but then a great man came to them, his name was Isa salam, Jesus, and they refused to believe in him. And then the Christians did a little better than the Jews, they believed in everybody from Adam salam, including Jesus, then they added some shirk to it. But they stopped at another great man, Muhammad sallallahu But we're in the safest position, and we believe in every single prophet sent by Allah from Adam salam, including Jesus and including Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One of the great things and one of the things that bring relief to a lot of Muslims is that everything in our religion makes sense. There is no nonsensical concept, concept that is illogical that you have to believe in. We don't have anything like that. There are some things that are beyond human understanding, 
but they still make sense. But it's, an, it's a very important thing that there's nothing that doesn't make any sense that you have to believe in. And, and not only that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to contemplate, to think, to consider. Even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how to tell if the Quran was not from Allah, which is known as a falsification test. You know, if something is false, you can, uh, sorry, if something is true, you can try to falsify it. You can try to prove it false. But if something is false, not 100% of the time, but if something is false, you can't try to prove it false. Sometimes. I'll give you an example. I tell you, every time your computer crashes, it's due to an invisible pink unicorn nudging it with its horn. All right? Now, can you try to disprove this? Can you falsify that? How are you going to do that? Are you going to give... There, you have a camera that can, you know, infrared or whatever, uh, capture the image of invisible pink unicorns. They have one for blue, but pink, not yet. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to prove this false? So most of the time when something is false, it's hard to prove false. But if something is true, you can challenge it. If I tell you I have the fastest car in the world, we can do a lap and time it and compare it against other cars. We can race it against another car. You can try to prove it false. And then we can see if it's true or not. But when, a lot of times when something is false, you can't falsify it. Anyways, going back to the computers, everyone knows the reason they crash is that their PCs are not, not uh, Macs, right? <laughs> All right. The, now, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is in Surah An-Nisa, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا do they not contemplate the Qur'an? Had it been from other than Allah, they would have found a lot of discrepancies. So Allah is telling you how to tell if this book is from Allah or not. If it's not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a human being wrote it, you're going to find contradictions. It's over 600 pages, and you're going to find one, part it says, one time it says this, the other time it says the other. Or this time it contradicts what it said earlier. And there's so many things amazing about the Qur'an. We'll get to them towards, a little bit towards the end. Now, Islam is a religion that is very strict in issues of belief. It's strict in issues of belief. So in what we call aqidah, things that we believe in, about Allah, the prophets, the angels, the books, the day of judgment, divine decree, all these things, it's very strict there. So if a Muslim, for example, says, I believe in all the prophets, and I'm going to pray and fast in Ramadan and do everything, but I'm not, I don't believe in Moses, in Musa alayhi salam. So this person doesn't become a bad Muslim, he is not a Muslim anymore. Because Islam is very strict in issues of belief. If someone says, I'm not sure if Allah is one or two, I'm, I have issues there. He's not a Muslim until he can affirms and confirms that there's only one God. So it's very strict on issues of belief, but it's relaxed on issues of fiqh. On issues of fiqh, there can be more than one opinion. There can be two correct opinions, even though most of the time one is right, one is wrong but it's still within an acceptable field where you can pick this one or that one, or if your sheikh said go with that one, you go with it and there's no blame on you. It's relaxed with issues of fiqh. But this is something that is not understood by a lot of Muslims, and they make religion strict in issues of fiqh and relaxed on issues of aqidah. And I'll tell you a true story. I was in a, in a masjid. It was a Jum'ah prayer in a masjid in Australia. And the imam is like a young guy and a very nice guy. Look, after the, he made an announcement after the Jum'ah. He was very harsh in the announcement. We get in his car. He's a very lively, very fun guy. So I asked him, I said, listen, now I have to ask you, why were you so harsh when you made the announcement after Jum'ah? He said, Sheikh, you don't know the, the, the community here. He said, you know, we've got some troublemakers. He said, one time I invited the guest khatib. And someone waited. And look at this. <laughs> look how conniving. The guy waited until the middle of the khutbah, then he stood up. Brothers and sisters, do not pray behind this imam, because I saw him in the bathroom making wudu. First of all, why are you... <laughs> I gotta tell you, some people are like that, like, oh, the imam's in here? Let me see how he does this thing. I have a friend of mine, he's a little crazy, and he, he's an imam, and I'm not gonna mention his name, most of you know him. He says... I, I walked into the stall in the bathroom and I came out. He said, this uncle caught me in the musalla. He said, I saw you, brother. You went into the stalls and you did not have the lorta. <laughs> and sorry to be crass, you guys, 
but it's a true story. The Imam just, uh, just whispered into his ear, I passed gas. <laughs> I don't need water for that. Why did you put your nose in that business, Aslan, to stay out of it? Yeah. I had water, I had Pepsi, anyways, let's go back. It's a true story, I'm sorry. But, so let's go back to the Australia story. So, in the, Austra so the Imam says, this guy waited in the, yeah, in the middle of the khutbah, and he got up and he says, do not pray behind this Imam, because I, I saw him making wudu, he wiped over his socks, and his socks were not made of leather. And here's the worst part. A group of people stood up from the middle of the khutbah. Forget Jum'ah ah and the importance of Jum'ah. Ah. How dare he not wipe over leather socks? And they walked out. Now, I always tell people, imagine the imam said the exact opposite. Imagine the imam, no, not the imam, our troublemaker guy. Imagine he stood up and he said, brothers and sisters, do not pray behind this imam because he does not believe that Allah is above his throne and Allah mentioned over six times in the Quran that he's above his throne. What do you think would happen? Brother, don't split the ummah over these things. Sit down. So fiqh, we've made it more important. Fiqh, jurisprudence, issues of wudu, tahara, fasting, do's and don'ts, halal, haram. We made that more important than issues of aqidah. Issues of aqidah, brother, don't split the ummah over these things. These things are issues of difference. Fiqh is issues of difference. And there are multiple opinions sometimes. Even the companions that disagreed on some opinions. That's more relaxed. Aqidah is strict. So our religion is a strict religion when it comes to issues of belief. But it is far more relaxed when it comes to issues of fiqh or jurisprudence. Now when it comes into issues of fiqh, the scholars say the religion can be split into two parts. And this is very important. Ibadat and mu'amalat. Al-ibadat, these are the acts of worship. And that's what you do. You present to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's between you and Allah azza wa jal. And then the mu'amalat are your dealings. Whether they be business dealings or just about your manners. And this is an important part that is kind of like one of the forgotten aspects of Islam now. The importance of mu'amalat and, and the importance of good manners and good conduct. Now we see good manners as extra credit. If after I fast Ramadan and I pray five times a day, and if I have leftover time, then I'll smile for extra credit and be nice to you for extra credit. And that's why, and inshallah, this is not in your community, but a lot of communities you go and you find this person who's very religious, always the first one in the masjid, big beard, but he's very rude, or he's just frowning all the time, or the only words that come out of his mouth, haram, or what's your dalil? And always confrontational. And just abrasive, every time you have some like a encounter with him, it's abrasive because he's just always frowning. What's your evidence? What's your delete? This is haram. That's mak if it's not mak haram, it's makro. So, because he doesn't understand the importance of good manners in Islam. And when you look at the ahadith on the importance of manners, you start to see, you know what? This is really a huge part of our religion. And this should be how we present our religion to others. Now today, if you find a non-Muslim who has encountered a da'ya at a da'wah table somewhere, or maybe some roommate or some classmate or co-worker gave them a pamphlet about Islam, meaning you encounter a non-Muslim who knows something about Islam, what do you think they would have heard about Islam? They'll know about Tawheed and the five pillars, true or false? Because that's how we present Islam, that's how our pamphlets focus on the five pillars, I don't have anything against that. I actually teach about the five pillars when you're giving da'wah to people. So there's some benefit there. But we don't hardly mention manners and good akhlaq. And that's why when Abu Sufyan, the companion, عن, before he became Muslim, when he encountered Heraclius, and Heraclius asked him, what does he teach you? He mentioned five, if you want to get technical, six points of the teachings of Islam. So this is a non-Muslim now explaining Islam to another non-Muslim, which means it's going to give us an insight into how he was presented Islam, or present, Islam was presented to him. And he mentions three points that are related to manners. Three points that are related to manners. Keep our promises, you know, and, and return whatever is entrusted to us. So he mentions issues of manners because that's how Islam was presented to them. And we know the history of Islam. It's people's conduct and manners and truthfulness of merchants that affected people and brought many into Islam. 
They didn't have pamphlets and websites and all the noise that we have. And still people were coming to Islam in droves or in huge numbers. Because that's what really affects people. And, and I don't want this to become one of those negative talks, okay? But there are multiple stories. This is, uh, this is like early 90s, late 80s. There were stories of people who became Muslim in America and then they traveled overseas. And these were two different stories about two different people. They don't even know each other. And both of them made the same comment. <laughs> both of them said, Alhamdulillah, who introduced me to Islam before he introduced me to the Muslims. And it's painful to hear a statement like that. But what they're saying is, if I would have seen the Muslims first, like you travel, just pick a, a random Muslim country. I don't want to mention anyone by name. Egypt. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, not Egypt. I'm, not, I'm just kidding. Not Egypt. Just pick any random Muslim country. Just throw a dart at the map and pick a Muslim country and go to it. And then go to a bazaar and go to a market. And then you will see, I don't want to make it negative, but you'll see in dealings and you see dishonesty and, and all kinds of things. Now, those are not the kinds of things that will attract people to, to Islam. So they both said, two different individuals, both made the same comment. They said, Alhamdulillah, who introduced me to Islam before I saw the Muslims. Because if I would have seen that, I would have said, no, they can't be upon the truth. They can't be upon the truth. And that's why there's that dua in the Quran where Ibrahim السلام, said, وَلَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Don't make us a fitna for the disbelievers. What does that mean? It means the disbeliever has many things and many misconceptions and doubtful issues that are keeping them from becoming Muslim. But on top of that, if they look at the believers, they see that they're dishonest and they see that they're in this, there's injustice and they see all kinds of things wrong in their society. That will be an additional reason not to become a Muslim or submit to Allah Azza wa So he's saying, don't make us another reason that keeps people away from your religion. And that's why we so need to focus on improving our manners. Imagine in America, if you just ask any random person, hey, who have the best manners in America? And they all said the Muslims. What would, our, what would the terrain look like in America? It would look a lot different. So, and we know the hadith. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, somebody take a random guess. He said, Akmalul mu'minina imana. The most complete in iman of the believers are, take a guess, the best of them in manners. Abu Huraira asked the Prophet ﷺ of the top two things that are heavy, or actually uh, that are the top two things that will take you into Jannah. Guess what one of them is? The top two things that take you into paradise. One of them was good manners. Then uh, in another hadith, Prophet ﷺ described the heaviest thing on your scale. You've got salah, you've got fasting, you've got zakah. But which is the densest object? Because Allah will physically weigh deeds. Which deed is the heaviest on the scale? Take a random guess. Good manners. Okay? You want to be of the most beloved of people to Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said the most beloved of the, creature, the, the, the believers to Allah? Take a wild guess. So, okay, let's, we're figuring out the pattern, right? Those who have the best manners. You want to be on the Day of Judgment near the Prophet ﷺ. In Al-Jannah, you want to be near him, his neighbor, because which level do you think he is at? The highest level. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the ones who will be closest to me, أَقْرَبَكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا يعني Closest to me on the Day of Judgment, take a wild guess. Those who have the best manners. Then Abu Huraira asked the Prophet ﷺ, of the top two things that lead people to the hellfire, what do you think one of them was? Bad manners, excellent, you reversed it, good job. That's, what, that's exactly what it is. And that's how heavy, that's how important it is. And that's, even the acts of worship, they're supposed to affect our manners. And this is a very important part of Islam. And this is, you probably wouldn't expect, we're going to focus on manners in a talk about what is Islam. Yeah, that is Islam. Because even the acts of worship are designed to impact your behavior. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Establish the prayer. Indeed, the prayer prevents the reprehensible acts and the munkar, yani the, the sins basically. But the salah, here's the act of worship, here's the impact it's supposed to have on your manners. Hajj, فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجْ In hajj, there's no vain talk, there's no arguing. And what is that? The act of worship and the impact it's supposed to have on your manners. When you're fasting, that's the act of worship and someone fights with you or curses you, what do you do? You say? 
you say it's own, right? What do you say? <laughs> and you say it out loud so they audibly, so they can hear it. You say that I am fasting, I am fasting. Act of worship and the impact it's supposed to have. So it's all about that. Even the Prophet ﷺ, when he was explaining why he was sent, he could say, Innama bu'ithtu, I was sent so that people would say, La ilaha illallah. I was sent so that only Allah will be worshipped on earth. But he said, Innama bu'ithtu li utammima makarim al akhlaq. I was sent to perfect the most noble of good character. It's as if all I'm here to do is just improve people's manners. So how could it not be a very important part of Islam? Who is the best of all the believers? Meaning, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ The best of you are the best of you to their wives. What does that mean? And why the wives? Because you can be the sweetest guy in the masjid. And you've probably seen this. You know, the, the guy who is about to faint from the heavy iman in his heart. You can identify them. Their eyes are half closed. Their head is tilted. And you tell them, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, miskeen, khalas, haymut. Alhamdulillah. And then this guy goes home and he's a monster with his wife. He destroys things and he curses and he yells and he's, and he's a lion. He's a, he's a kitten outside, but he's a lion in the house. And he, so the scholar said, why did the Prophet make the litmus test of a good believer, how he treats his wife? They said because it's a very high chance that if he is well-mannered in the home, he's well-mannered outside the home. But you meet people well-mannered outside the home, and inside the home, they're horrible people. And my wife is not here, I can say this with confidence. <laughs> if she was here, she'd be doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looking up, rolling her eyes. <laughs> All right, people. And of course, <clears throat> the focal point is the Tawheed of Allah Azza wa And that's what every prophet has called to. Every prophet has called to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is Tawheed. And warned of one thing more than anything else, and that is shirk. That is worshiping something besides Allah or something along with Allah is shirk as well. Just as an interesting story, uh, <laughs> when I was in Sweden, I found out the Swedish word for church is shirke. <laughs> and when I told them that, they were like, oh, the, all the people growing up, they're like, we never noticed that because it's their language. Like, we never noticed that. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what they do there, right? Shirke. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, so, we've got the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not worshipping or relying upon or any feeling that you would have in a special way towards Allah azza wa you cannot have it towards any other living thing or object in the same way. Meaning, fear is natural. You can be afraid of something. But you are not allowed to be afraid of something or someone the way you're afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No way. Because that would then start to fall into this area of shirk. So we've got the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's how you become a Muslim. You say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. You are negating, you're saying there is nothing that is deserving of being worshipped. And then you are affirming, except Allah alone. And then the second part is, and that Muhammad is Rasulullah. So how much time do I have left? Seven minutes? Okay. So as for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One of the first things, you see that he is, he clearly came from the same school. Someone of good and upstanding moral character, from good lineage, who also did not reverse or change any of the Ten Commandments. We share a lot of the same basic moral code as far as Judaism, Christianity concerned, but the number one message is the same, that there's only one God worthy of worship. He was a shepherd, he was known to be trustworthy. So. Everything about the life and teachings of Muhammad وسلم, indicate that he was a genuine prophet, a prophet sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the fact that he confirmed all the prophets before him, which also indicates that he's a genuine prophet. So one of the interesting things, when early Christians encountered Islam, they had to explain what Islam was. And they came up with a number of different explanations, but one of them didn't work very well. They said that uh, Islam was the Antichrist. Right? But that didn't, this is there amongst the many things, but this one didn't work very well because anti Christ, you know what anti means? 
And how can in the religion of the Antichrist you have to believe in Isa, in Jesus, the son of Mary? And if you don't believe in him, you're not part of that religion anymore. That doesn't sound anti. That's very pro. <laughs> that was the first thing that backfired. And there were other things, and that, the other thing was that even in Christian uh, like studies, the Antichrist gets weaker. He comes out strong, and he gets weaker. Same thing in Islam. He comes out strong, and then eventually gets weakened. So, but Islam kept growing and growing and growing, and not to change the subject, but that's where they had to explain, explain the growth of Islam, so they said it was spread by the sword, and until today we're battling this nonsense that, oh, Islam was spread by the sword. And by that, they don't mean through conquest. They mean that someone would be brought, they would have them kneel down, they put the sword in their neck, and then they would say, become Muslim or else. And we know that that has never happened in, in history, and if it happened, they wouldn't even count that Islam would not count, and we know no compulsion, no coercion in religion, so there's no room for that. So the Prophet ﷺ, there's a fun exercise we do, and uh, I would have liked to have more time for it, but let's just give the gist of it. We need to analyze. So, and this is a good exercise to do with your neighbor, your non-Muslim neighbor, your co-worker, your classmate. We need to analyze the teachings, the actions, the life of the Prophet ﷺ. First of all, there's nobody in human history whose life has been as documented, as thoroughly, thoroughly documented as a Nabi ﷺ. Like we know everything. We know the direction he combed his hair. We know how he relieved himself, how he washed, which shoe he put on first. We, and even, we know everything about him. And even things in his night worship because he had you know, more than one wife and each one narrates something about his private life so there's no one more documented. We've got a lot of data, and now we're going to use this data to analyze to see whether the Prophet ﷺ was a genuine prophet or an imposter. <coughs> genuine prophets will behave in this pattern, in this way. And imposters would have this other character, these other characteristics, because, like, for example, a genuine prophet would practice what he would preach. An imposter, probably not. He would say, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And he would sleep most of the night, right? Or he would tell people to fast, then he's eating secretly. And all kinds of things. Uh, you'll find these disparities. And you can just make a whole list of how do you expect a genuine prophet to behave? How do you expect an imposter to behave? If someone walked in this room right now and said, I'm a prophet of God, God sent me. How would you challenge that? Just through asking questions. We already know he's an imposter. But how would you challenge that through asking questions? You would ask him, what is the most important teaching in your religion? If he doesn't say tawheed, strike one. What's the name of the angel that comes to you? If he doesn't say Jibreel, strike two, right? There's a pattern that never changes with the prophets. Like the Mormon prophet, when he, he said the angel who came to him, his name was Moroni, which tells you what he thinks you are. <laughs> Anyways, so, so then you go through and you list what would be the possible motives, meaning a man in Arabia, and in Arabia sometimes... A war would go on for years because of a race between two horses and this horse beat the other. Then they start a fight. Then a war goes on for two years. So if a man's going to, an imposter is going to challenge the religion of his people, you know for sure they're going to try to kill him. So no, he knows he's risking his life. So what would be the motive? And then list as many motives as possible. Why would he risk his life? For money? For women? For fame? for you know, popularity, for luxury, life of luxury? Or did he do it because he just loved problems and war and he liked to mislead people? One time I was doing this exercise with, with a Jewish man and he goes, well, maybe he was an alien. Did you ever think of that? From outer space. I said, okay, let's put it down. We wrote it down. Oh, maybe he was a schizophrenic. Okay, we wrote it down. Maybe he had some kind of mental disorder. He heard voices. Write it down. And then we write down as many motives, motives as you can. And now go back and based on the actions and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning Quran and Hadith, analyze and see if that motive holds water or not. So, okay, he did it for money. So you're telling me he created a new religion and risked his life for money? Guess what? He already had money. When he was married to Khadija, they were very wealthy. He actually became poor after becoming a prophet. Well, maybe it backfired. Okay. But when he died, there were 100,000 companions that would give their life. He could have asked each one for money. He could have been rich again. So take money out. Doesn't make any sense. All right, maybe he was just doing it to become popular. All right. So he wrote a book of 600 pages long, 
just to pump his name up in history and so he could become popular. All right, how many times is the name Muhammad mentioned in the Quran? Four? Four, you agree? That's true, and if you said five, you'd be right, because four times it says Muhammad, one time it says Ahmad. Okay, how many times is the name Moses or Musa mentioned in the Quran? 136 times. And Ayyub, 25. And Dawood, alayhi salam, 16. And Sulaiman, 17. And just keep going and going and going. So he's risking his life so his name would be mentioned and remembered, but then he spends 600 pages of this book talking about other people more than himself. So okay, cross that one out. And you can go through all the motives and you can cross every one of them out. And you do this exercise with your non-Muslim friend or neighbor or relative. And they will at the end see that there is absolutely no way that he risked his life for this motive. He's not a genuine prophet. And yet at the end of the day, uh, th that he was like you could not see it through the data that it's clear. right? And then how would he be able to write the Quran? And how would he put all this knowledge and all these different types of laws and all this system of justice and governance and, and divorce and raising children? How did he know all this stuff in the desert in Arabia? So the more you do it, I'm just going to conclude with this. I did this exercise one time with a co co-worker, friend of mine. And then we went into other reasons why he couldn't have been an imposter. Like even things like, you know, like the coincidences, like uh, when during the burial of his infant son, and I'm going to stop, okay? During the burial of his infant son, what happened? During the burial of Ibrahim. And remember, there was an eclipse of the sun, right? And the people said, yeah, even the, the, the sun is saddened at the death of Ibrahim. And the Prophet said, no. He stopped him and he said, no. These are not natural phenomena. And they don't, the sun is not saddened nor happy at the birth or death of anybody. Now, how would an imposter take advantage of that moment? If you're an imposter, you need some kind of miracle. And then your son dies, and then the sun eclipses at the same time. You would milk every drop out of the aircraft. You see, even the sun is saddened at the death of my child. Give me money. Give me money quickly. You take advantage of it. <laughs> so, I, so I did the exercise with my friend, and I'm done. And I said, and then we looked through everything, and he saw that it was not possible that an imposter could write a book like the Quran, create a religion like it, and then the teachings don't. Because if, it's, because if he pretended to be a prophet because he wanted money, guess what the Quran would say? Give 10% of your earnings to the prophet. Give this to the prophet. If you wanted women, take your, children, take your daughter to the prophet. Give your sister to the prophet. It would be reflected in his teachings. So then my friend goes, my coworker, he goes, well, I believe, because I listed all the talents of the Prophet ﷺ, and it was like a huge list of them. He would have to know this and this and this. So the guy goes, uh, he has to give an explanation. He goes, I believe that Muhammad ﷺ was the reincarnation of all the greatest minds in human history into one person. That's his only explanation. I said, I'm going to ask you a question, just be honest with me. What do you think is more plausible? That he's a reincarnation of all the greatest minds of human history? Or that he was just a genuine prophet of Allah. And wallahi, the guy looked down in shame like this and he goes, he was probably just a genuine prophet of Allah. Zakum la khair for listening attentively. Sallallahu alayhi wa barakatuh. Muhammad, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. We will begin the Q&A session in five minutes. Uh, so if you guys could stay in your seats, we'll be uh, starting soon. On the screen will be a QR code. Ryan, could you switch that over? Um, it's an anonymous QR code. Uh, the speakers will be able to read the questions and answer them. And we will have MSO members pass out some paper for questions as well.
think I can hear you. Do you guys lift the other table up here? Yeah. which questions you guys want to answer. And, uh, however, there's going to be a lot of questions and we probably won't be able to get through them. It's muted. It's, good. it's not muted. Oh. Hopefully no one heard me. <laughs> um, and you might have to share that with uh, Dr. Susie Ismail. Alhamdulillah. I need to get some copies of your book, inshallah. Oh, yes, definitely. Right. Oh, man. I'm saying my, my son... Uh, just got accepted to a master's program that we're waiting to hear back from. So, oh, congratulations, Mubarak. May Allah protect you and keep his iman very firm. Thank you so much for talking about it. 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 You can answer, then you can continue that. For the note cards, we'll just pass them and we'll come in, inshallah. Should I sit down? Oh, yeah. Later. Good luck. Ready? Up to you guys. You guys. Assalamu alaikum. We'll begin the Q&A session now. Uh, the speakers will receive the questions and they can read them out loud and they will answer them, inshallah. So I'll let either three of you choose who, who will start. Ladies first.
How about I start in the meantime? Because, because this first one was... Uh, so this first question says, how old was the, the, the son of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he died? Meaning Ibrahim, who was born to the Prophet from Mary al Qiptiya. He was born in the 8th year after the Hijrah and he died in the 10th year after the Hijrah. So he was about 18 months old when he died. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. We'll just go in order, and then we'll see. I'm sorry. All right, so we're going to take the questions as they come. We'll go in order, and we'll ask them, and then see uh, who wants to answer. So what should you do if you're a parent to get your kids to start praying, or how can you encourage them? So I think that's a great question. Um, and I would say probably, you know, what we've been talking about a lot today, that, you know, what are you doing? You know, what does your prayer look like? Are you rushing in between, you know, like uh, maybe you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're coming home from work, you're exhausted, and you're like, oh, I have to pray Aisha still, right? Or are you getting up, you know, praying your salah, and then showing how that brings ease to your heart, brings calm to what it is that you're doing? So focus on your own salah. Make your salah that place of joy that others will come to. But with that said, we also know, and I think tomorrow in one of the sessions, we'll talk a little bit more about the stages of tarbiyah and how our children will emulate us at different stages. So definitely the child who is playing around you while you are praying. You know, if your response to that child is, go away, you're distracting me, you can't play while I'm praying, know that this is not what the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guided us towards, us, uh, us towards. When we know that Al Hassan Wal Hussein, the grandsons of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would climb upon his back when he was in prayer and he wouldn't remove them. So make the prayer a place of of connection, a place of tranquility, but also a place where the children feel safe, feel wanted, feel welcome. The masjid should be the same. So I'll take one of the written questions. Um, the question is, what are the best ways to work on your relationship with your spouse? I just want to say thank you so much for asking this question. It's such an important one. And you asking this is really like heartwarming because I think one of the biggest issues in our community is that our whole lives, we're told the opposite gender are haram. Boys are haram. Don't talk to boys, right? As you're growing up, don't interact with them. And then we're 25 years old and we get a marriage proposal and then what happens? We get really excited, get married, get thrown into an apartment with this other person and then just expected to somehow know how to make it work. And that's a huge problem. The example I can give you is like taking someone like me and putting me into an operating room and expecting me to know how to operate on someone. I don't have the training, so it's not fair. It's putting me at a disadvantage. And so the number one thing that I can say is education. Learn about relationships. Relationships, what makes relationships work is an actual science. There's a really famous, world-renowned relationship expert. His name is Dr. John Gottman. And he found that he can observe a couple and predict whether or not they'll stay together or separate, and he's between 90 and 96% accurate. Because there are things that if you do them in a relationship, they'll make them happy and healthy. And there are things that if you do them in a relationship, they harm the relationship. They hurt the relationship and it leads to unhappiness and leads to separation. So number one, learn. Learn about relationships. How? MashaAllah, I just saw that Dr. Susie, MashaAllah, Lama Barak has two beautiful books here on marriage. Buy them, read them. There are so many wonderful uh, resources out there for Muslims. There's another book that I'd recommend. I think it's called The Healthy Muslim Marriage. If you, Google, if you Google it, it's like a blue book and it has a golden yellow on it. That one's a really good book as well. Um, I would also recommend reading a book like The Seven Principles for Making a Marriage Work by Dr. John Gottman. And there are exercises that you can talk through with your spouse. Now let's say you do this for a few months and you don't notice that your relationship's getting better. I would then recommend reaching out to a, and a key word, Muslim marriage therapist, 
I recommend the Khalil Center. If you Google them, they have therapists all over the country, and they do offer uh, therapy online as well. They're wonderful. So find a Muslim therapist and talk to them. Sometimes the therapist can talk to the couple and find out the little things or the not so little things that each of the spouses are doing that's harming the relationship and help them learn how to overcome that. Learn how to adapt more healthier, better uh, habits and ways of conflict resolution and communication. And it can really help a relationship. But don't wait too long. On average, the couple waits six years after experiencing really difficult circumstances in the relationship. Like they've been unhappy for so many years, and then they get to a point where they're fed up, and then they reach out for help. So we don't want to wait until it's that bad to reach out for help. If you're doing this, you do it for one or two months, you're reading, you're trying to apply the principles and the skills that you're learning, and you notice that your marriage is not improving, then seek professional help. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed night of Sha'ban that he blesses us all with beautiful, happy, healthy, tranquil relationships, that he fills our marriages with love, mercy, and compassion. And for those who are not married, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us righteous, pious spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. Allahumma ameen. So are, are we, we're not going on, or are we just skipping around, right? All right, let's do some easy ones. That's what I love about written questions. You answer the easy ones, and you pretend we're out of time for the difficult. <laughs> so this one says, should Muslims wear crystals and pray to the ancestors? And the answer is no. <laughs> Definitely not. You do that, then you're committing shirk, you're leaving Islam. You go pray to ancestors. What ancestors? They're all in their graves, and... May Allah help them in whatever situation they're in. You're praying to them and they're begging you to make dua for them. So no. And wearing crystals, obviously you understand that it means a crystal that is supposed to um, harness some kind of power or ward some kind of evil. I, I know you're not just asking about wearing crystal as or, or cubic zirconias. So anything that is, has some kind of supposed power or ability or will push away this or bring that, you do not engage in that. Uh, you do not wear it. You don't believe in it because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that power. No crystal or anything else. And you definitely, definitely do not commit shirk and pray to ancestors. But with that, I've got to tell you a quick funny story. All right. So you guys know Sheikh Walid Basuni. He's, our, <laughs> he's the imam of our masjid, right? And he was at this interfaith uh, event. And there was a lady and and we respect all religions. But she was dressed like she was from Star Wars. Like she had a robe, a Hollywood style robe. You know that fake Hollywood looking? She's got this robe and she's got this crooked staff. And it has this fake crystal on top of it. And so while she's sitting this to the sheikh, he touches the crystal. And she goes, oh, oh no, that's sacred. He goes, my daughter has one of those. <laughs> My daughter has one of those at home because he thought it was some fake toy. It looks like one of those fake crystals you'd buy in the toy section at Walmart. And she, and she got so mad and so offensive. But the, the moral of the story is that it's a shame when the, the attire of your dean looks like you're part of a play. And you've got a crystal that supposedly has some powers and it's just a little plastic thingy. That's the story anyway. <laughs> So I'll take the next one, um, which was a question about those who take their own lives. And you know the Islamic kind of perspective, and particularly in Muslim communities, uh, people look down on those who commit suicide. What do you say is the key in the face of this? So I know it's an uncomfortable topic. And I know, you know a lot of times we, we talk about trigger warnings. And it's a difficult topic to talk about. But we need to get more comfortable with talking about the difficult topics because, believe it or not, they surround us everywhere. And children as young as five, six, seven years old see on the internet, see on television, um, words like suicide, you know, um, words like depression, words related to LGBTQ issues, which we're gonna talk about tomorrow. 
So we do need to become more comfortable talking about this. Now, the reality is that you know when we talk about suicide ideation, that is of course different than the act of suicide. And suicide ideation is the thoughts of taking one's life, the thoughts of, of harming oneself, right? But we also know that there are stages before we get to that stage. And you know, one of my favorite verses in the Quran that really helps us better understand kind of the perspective of what happens when we're struggling so much or we're going through so much difficulty. And maybe we have that moment where we say, I wish I wasn't here anymore. I wish I wasn't going through this. Maybe it would be better if I didn't experience this. And we know in the Quran, we have the example of Maryam alayha salam when she was going through labor, the most physical pain that a woman can experience, the emotional pain, the difficulty that she was going through, despite being one of the women who is chosen and promised Jannah. In that moment, in the Quran, we are told she calls out to Allah and she says, Ya laytani mit qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyan man sayya. Oh, if only I had died before this and had been of those who were forgotten. And in that moment of pain when she calls out, we see in the Quran that a voice calls from beneath her. لا تحزني نودي من تحتها. That a voice comes beneath her saying, do not be sad. So this is first an understanding for us that the feelings, the emotions that we may have, the mental struggles that we may go through when we're going through a difficult time may sometimes push us to a point where we say, I wish I was not here. But it is in that moment that we do need help. It is in that moment and before that moment even that we want to seek out those who can remind us not to be sad, those who can help us through this difficulty. And yes, sometimes you know we will tell someone, oh, you're sad, pray two rak'ahs. But we all know that that is not a substitute for also utilizing the means that Allah Azza wa Jal puts in your path to help you through it. So as a Muslim community, I think we need to mature a little bit more to learn how collectively to talk about suicide, to say the word, to understand that, exi that it exists. We know Dr. Ranya Awad from the uh, Islamic Psychology Lab at Stanford conducted a study uh, just recently, I believe it was about a year ago, um, that indicated that Muslim youth in particular are twice as likely, or I believe it was between the ages of 18 and 21, are twice as likely to attempt suicide as non-Muslim youth in America. So we do need to learn how to talk about it. We do need to understand it. We also need to be more preventative in our approach. We spend so much time focusing on whether or not you know, we should pray janazah on someone who passed away who took their own life, and less time focusing on what do we need to do to prevent this from happening in our communities. So that's the response I'm going to give, but I'm also going to toss it back to Sheikh if he has more of an Islamic perspective or a fiqh perspective on it. All right. And please, if you are here today, and if any of our talks, any of our conversations are triggering in any way, because I know Ustada Dunya, myself, tomorrow, Dr. Samira, will talk about mental health issues. Please do not stay silent. Seek help, reach out, talk to us, unpack it. Do not go home feeling like hurt or harmed by anything that may have been said. All right, Bismillah. So there's a question here that asks, how do I forgive myself for past sins? I understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful and I ask his forgiveness, but it's hard to forgive myself and go forward. You know, thanks for being so vulnerable. And I think this is something that a lot of us feel and go through. And I think because when we were younger, it was hard for us to seek the forgiveness of our caregivers and for them to actually say, you know, it's okay, I forgive you. Um, what you did, the mistake that you did just made you human. And so there are a few tips that I want to share with you. Number one, understanding that actually that's a part of your nature. The Prophet wasallam actually said that every child of Adam commits mistakes, but the best of them are those who realize it and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. That's number one. Number two is knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually loves when you turn to him in repentance. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah loves those who turn to him in repentance. And there's a beautiful narration where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, he gave this analogy. 
He said, what would you say of a man who is traveling in the middle of the desert and all he has is his camel? And on his camel are his bags that have the food and the water that's going to sustain him for his journey. So imagine, it's the most important thing that person has at the moment. And what would you say about this man who stopped perhaps to relieve himself or to do something to rest and looked up and found that his camel that had all his food and water was gone? How devastating would that be? Really devastating, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ describes this man as looking around, frantically trying to find his camel, but he doesn't. So he kind of gives up and sits down and closes his eyes, kind of waiting to die because he's in the middle of the desert. He doesn't have food or water. And then suddenly he opens his eyes and he sees his camel right in front of him with all of his supplies. Can you imagine how happy that person would be? Very happy, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ says that this person's actually so happy that he makes a mistake and he calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because he's so happy and overjoyed, he accidentally says, Ya Allah, I am your Lord. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah is more happy when we turn to him in repentance than that man was that he found his camel. So knowing that Allah is happy with you, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is welcoming you back with open arms, and having self-compassion, and this word is key, self-compassion is to understand that we all make mistakes. And your mistakes don't define who you are. And don't expect from yourself what your creator doesn't expect of you. Allah never expected you to be perfect. If he wanted you to be perfect, he would have just made you into an angel who just does all the acts of worship and doesn't do anything else. And so, anytime you think of those mistakes, those past sins that you've made, and you feel this feeling of, oh, I don't think Allah could ever forgive me, I can't even forgive myself, know that that's from shaitan. Know that once you turn to Allah in repentance sincerely and you said, Ya Allah, forgive me, He forgave you. And so who am I not to forgive myself if the one that I transgressed, the one that I sinned against, forgave me? And so practice that self-compassion. Um, learn about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very helpful. There's a beautiful book about the names of Allah. I think uh, it's by Dr. Jinan or Jihan. Anyways, if you Google it, it's a white book with a beautiful Islamic pattern. <laughs> As you can see, I, can re I can't remember names, but I can remember images. It's a beautiful book on the names of Allah. Read about the names of Allah. Learn who Allah is. You know, sometimes we have these bad feelings too, because unfortunately when we were younger, our caregivers or maybe our Sunday school teachers or Islamic studies teachers told us things like, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to put you in hell. And so we have this negative view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So try to change that and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does accept the repentance of those who repent. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. This question says, I'm curious, what is a definitive answer to a non-believer making the argument that the Prophet وسلم, especially focusing on the miracle at Cave Hira, was simply schizophrenic or imagining his revelation? All right. So I, I'll answer with a true story, and uh, I was doing that exercise with a Jewish man, and he says, have you ever thought maybe he's an epileptic? When he has his seizures, he comes up with these ideas, thoughts, and then when he comes out of it, he says, write this down, or he was a schizophrenic, or anything. And again, zoom out, take a step back and look at the life and teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. Does that make any sense? Because this is what I told him, since... Adam السلام, until today, how many schizophrenics, bipolar, um, uh, madmen, whatever you want, epileptics, have lived and died from that time until now? He said, many, thousands. He said, which one of them, after their seizure or whatever the, the way they went through, episode they went through, came out with a religion, a justice system, rules of raising children, marriage and divorce, business law, 
tax law, personal injury law, which, does it make sense? Does your question make sense now? And he was like, okay. Because let me tell you, if mad people were, any people like in the mental institutions were, were that, I'm trying to be correct here, if they were that, we would just be with notebooks and pens. Wait, yes, what do you see now? I see, and <laughs> just write it down. Uh, so uh, there's a video uh, that's on the, the on YouTube. It's called "Why the Prophet Muhammad Couldn't Have Written the Quran." Why the Prophet وسلم, couldn't have written the Quran? Just look it up. And I know, like by for a fact, over 1,000 people have become Muslim from that video, and we know them by email address, by name, not just like some random uh, piece of information. And you'll notice the narrator has a very beautiful voice. You understand this joke once you listen to it, inshallah. All right? Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. It's called, Why the Prophet couldn't, Muhammad couldn't have written the Quran. All right, so there's a lot of questions, and mashallah, they keep coming in. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can take a couple more maybe, and then inshallah, maybe we can continue uh, um, in the next sessions that, that are to come. Um, I'm just going to categorize a couple of them. There were several questions about hijab and the choice to begin wearing hijab, when to wear hijab, how to wear hijab, um, parents not liking the wearing of hijab. Um, there were also a couple of questions about the LGBTQ uh, issues from an Islamic perspective, um, also from a personal perspective, that how do you interact with someone who may have um, uh, come out or identified as being part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so I'm going to ask my uh, co-panelists first, <laughs> are there any of these questions that you'd like to t tackle? No, we would like you to tackle them. Okay. <laughs> I was about to pass it down this way. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, first I'll talk about the, um, the questions that are coming up in terms of uh, LGBTQIA+. How do we respond as a Muslim community? What is the Islamic perspective on it? Um, and then I'll leave maybe uh, Sister Dunya to answer some of the hijab questions. So this is an important topic. And just like I was saying before, you know, we can't keep shying away from difficult topics, uncomfortable topics, topics that are, are hard to talk about because, yes, it surrounds us. It's everywhere. And we see several different faith communities responding differently to what is happening in our schools, such as the gender-bred curriculum, education that is geared towards incorporating gender nonconformity and non-binary gender approaches in the curriculum for children as young as age five. Um, I come from the New York, New Jersey area, so we tend to see these uh, curricula introduced quite early. We've had this curriculum in our school systems for about three years now, and I know it's been making its way across the country. Um, and we see a lot of different faith groups standing up and you know, saying different things. There are faith groups that feel that um, you know, this is fine, encouraging of the idea of viewing gender as non-binary or um, not having gender align with the traditional conceptualization of male and female. We see other faith groups you know, saying, nope, you can't teach this in school, this is wrong. Then we also see other sides that will come out and say, well, if you stand against anything that's in the LGBTQIA plus curriculum, then you are homophobic. Um, you're not kind of uh, uh, aligning with the rights of others. So from an Islamic perspective, as the sheikh had mentioned previously, shirk is the only sin that removes someone from Islam, right? And, and shirk, shirk, right, not believing in Allah, not believing in, in the foundations of belief, this is what removes someone from Islam. Now, 20 years ago, again, I'll, I'll, I'll give my age, but 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, when I was in uh, middle school, high school, say, um, what was the main problem, right? Most parents, most families were terrified of their daughter coming home and saying, I have a boyfriend, or of their son coming home and saying, I have a girlfriend. There was no fear of the daughter coming home and saying, I have a girlfriend, or the boy coming home and saying, I have a boyfriend, right? And in a matter of two decades, the fears have changed. But the reality is that when you look at any relationship that does not align with the Islamic perspective in which the Qur'an clearly defines to us what it means to have a marriage in Surah Al-Rum, in the marriage verse, in verse 21, we have a clear understanding of what marriage is, and that marriage exists between the male and the female. And any relationship, لا تقربوا الزنا, we're told in the Qur'an, do not go near that which could, could lead to adultery. Any premarital engagement in intimacy with anyone does not align with Islam. 
And I know that we will you, know, you do a quick internet search and you will see all sorts of perspectives that are coming out about, well, the Prophet Lut's situation was this and it's not this. But the reality is that we know from an Islamic perspective that what is considered permissible halal is the uh, physical intimate relationship between male and female in the marital relationship only. Now, what about when we're not talking about the physical aspect of it? Because what we know with the LGBTQIA plus push, it is more a question of identity. So we have children as young as age, you know, 9, 10, 11, um, coming into our Cornerstone offices and saying things like, you know, I am pansexual, I am uh, bisexual, I am homosexual, I identify as asexual. And when we talk to these children, many of them have no idea what the term sexual means. Many of them have never been physically intimate at all. But it becomes a form of identity. And when the identity becomes focused on a sexual orientation, rather than 20, 30 years ago, where uh, the, the act of being physically intimate in a certain way would define that concept of sexuality, when it becomes an identity, it usurps all other identities. So our youth, our children, our, our young adults begin to question their faith because if they identify as a, a sexual orientation that doesn't align with the Islamic perspective, then the question then becomes, how can I be Muslim? And so what we see right now is so many children, so many young adults, and, and so many college students as well, struggling with the idea of gender, struggling with the idea of sexual orientation, struggling with it as an identity. So. The perspective that I would take and that I think that many of us are kind of approaching this with now is that we need to step away from viewing this aspect as an identity and instead try to understand what does it mean when somebody comes out as pansexual, when somebody comes out as homosexual, when somebody comes out even as demisexual and, and we know there's several different orientations people can choose from, what does it mean to them? Is it something they've acted upon? Why would they take this on as an identity? What other parts of their identity that they are acting upon define them, right? And, and Islamically, we even know that we are told that we will not be able to say, I believe, without being tested. Even our belief and our belief as Muslims, as an identity, has to go through actions where we will be tested in that belief. So first of all, understanding it as, you know, what does it mean from an identity perspective? Now, questions about what do I do if my friend comes out as homosexual, right? The same thing you would do if your friend came out and said, you know, someone who liked someone of the opposite gender and said, I have a girlfriend, I have a boyfriend, I am, you know, doing something else that doesn't align with the Islamic concept. And again, if we go to our earlier lecture, we talked about the nasiha. You give the nasiha, right? Iddina nasiha. Our, our faith is a sincere uh, act of giving that advice with sincerity, right? You give the nasiha, you, you, you know, speak, again, from a base of knowledge, right? And if you don't have that base of knowledge, then you refer the friend to those who have that base of knowledge. You know, Sheikh Kamel, definitely take his card, you know, take uh, counselor's cards, know who to refer them to. But again, trying to focus or be kind of hyper vigilant on one aspect of life in which someone is acting in a way that doesn't align with Islamic principles doesn't necessarily work because we see people that are struggling in different ways across the gamut. And no, as Muslims, we are not homophobic. No, as Muslims, we are not anti uh, anyone who is trans. Um, we are not uh, uh, going to move in that direction of harming anyone who is, is in, under this identity because that is not our deen, that is not Islam. But we do, in terms of principles, Islamically, gender is binary. Allah has created the male and the female. And we can talk a lot about cultural elements. People often bring up the third gender in Oman or in, uh, in Pakistan or other areas. Um, but that is the Muhannith. And we'll talk a little bit more, I think, in tomorrow's session on this. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to turn it to Sister Dunya to answer some of the hijab questions. Miller Awards, Sister Suzy, because those are hard questions. This is not an easy space, by the way. There are so many you know, of our teachers, of our mashayikh, who are having a hard time figuring out how to answer these questions, not because it's ambiguous in our Quran or Sunnah, 
but because it's such a sensitive topic. And so may Allah reward you and increase you in goodness. Allahumma ameen. So I was asked to answer the questions regarding hijab. So since there are so many questions regarding hijab, I'm going to do a really kind of short, condensed, um, kind of general talk on hijab. Number one, understanding that hijab, like other acts of worship, are, is mandatory. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because uh, I've been sent a few TikTok videos of uh, Muslim women saying or claiming that hijab is not fard, that it's not something that's an obligation. So I want to clarify that, that hijab is an obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to observe hijab. Now, like Dr. Suzy said, not doing um, one of these things does not necessarily take you out of Islam. Denying it could, but not practicing does not take you out of Islam. And so one question that I did see is, what do you do if you have the intention to wear hijab, but you don't know where to start? Just start. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, in the beginning, it's not that easy. You know, recently, someone told me, you're so lucky, Sister Dunya, you've been wearing this black hijab for over a decade, and it's so easy for you. And I was like, hold on. Let's, let me clarify that. That's not easy. If I'm going to be completely honest with you, wearing hijab in America isn't easy, especially if you live in Texas. <laughs> I don't know what it's like over here. But I always get the stares, and people are always pointing at me. Aren't you hot in that? <laughs> right? It's not easy. And subhanAllah, it's actually a part of our fitra to want to be beautiful. Did you ever notice a little girl, when she wears a new dress, what is she doing? Twirling around, waiting for someone to notice, and say, oh, you look so beautiful, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to. And what do we do? Sami'na wa ata'na. We hear and we obey. And so if you're thinking about wearing hijab, Make dua, ask Allah to make it easy for you, to grant you the tawfiq to do it, and just do it. Just start. And every day, ask Allah for help. The Prophet wasallam, before sending Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu anhu off to Yemen to go teach the, Muslim, the, the people there about Islam, he puts his arm around him and he says, Ya Mu'ad, O oh Mu'ad. By the way, Mu'ad was a scholar. He was one of the most learned sahaba. He said, Ya Mu'adh, Wallahi inni uhibbuk. I swear by Allah I love you. Don't forget after every prayer to say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadatik. Oh Allah, help me to worship you, to remember you, to be grateful to you. We need Allah's help to do these acts of worship. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you to make it easier upon you. And then one question asked, what do you do if your parents are not really super um, excited about you wearing hijab? Have a, con have a conversation with them, right? You have to very kindly and gently with, right? Dr. Susie mentioned ad din al nasiha Our entire religion is sincere, loving advice very sincerely, very lovingly tell them that you love and respect them, but your obedience is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And out of your love and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to, to start wearing the hijab, and then ask them to please accept and to make dua for you that Allah keeps your heart firm. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us all in our worship of him. Worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these times is not easy. So much so that the Prophet sallallahu actually said it. He said there's going to come a time where worshiping Allah is going to be so hard. It's like holding coal that's on fire. Imagine sticking your hand into a barbecue or into your um, fireplace and pulling out a piece of coal and trying to hold it. But you know what else he said? He said, but those of them who are able to practice the religion will get the reward of 50. So the Sahaba, and think about the struggles the Sahaba went through. There are literally Sahaba who had coals, burning coals put on their back. There were Sahaba who were tortured and murdered. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, 50 of them, right? And he said, no, 50 of you. You're getting the reward of times 50 of the Sahaba.
Allah is a shakur. Allah is the most appreciative. When we do something for his sake, he will reward us because he appreciates it. And because it's harder for us, and each of us have our own circumstances, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward will be even greater for those who find it more difficult, right? The Prophet ﷺ said that the person who recites Qur'an with ease, they get a reward. But the person who opens the Qur'an, and it's hard for them to recite it, it's so difficult because maybe perhaps they're, they're not Arab. Maybe perhaps they never learned when they were younger, so it's so heavy on their tongue that they make mistakes and they recite chopped up. The Prophet ﷺ said, for that person, they get double the reward. So just remind yourself that. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try your best, inshaAllah. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam bisawab. You know what? So many questions here, like written and on this device. And many others are like, you know, please answer this other question that I asked earlier. And obviously, there's not going to be enough time, but I have to... Some are great, like I love halal meat questions. I want to answer that one. But I want to give pre uh, like, uh, precedence to, or preference to the ones where you feel like someone might be in trouble or it's more pressing, okay? So forgive me if I don't get to answer every question. This one says, I don't know if I'm religious or not. I don't know if I am. What, what can I do to help, meaning to help myself? So whoever you are in the room who wrote this question, Clearly, I don't know you, who you are, and I don't know you. But I can tell you this. You are religious, inshallah. You have to understand that. All that's happening to you is the shaitan is tricking you. Let me explain. Uh, people who are not religious don't sit there worrying about whether or not they're religious. Sah wa la Right? And the Prophet ﷺ gave an, gave an example like this also, that when, when the people had doubt, people came to the Prophet ﷺ, the companions came with doubts. Not doubts, fleeting doubt. I mean, you have an idea in your head, you know, uh, is, you know is, is there really a God? You know, everyone, this idea just rushes through your mind. You don't stop praying as a result. The Prophet ﷺ says to them, Awajatumu, you really found those things coming to you? He said, "Daka sarihul iman." He said, "That's exactly what iman is. That is evidence of iman. Why? Because the scholars gave this beautiful analogy. They said, if a thief is going to break into a warehouse to to rob it, is he going to break into an abandoned warehouse, or is he going to break into a, band, a, a warehouse filled with merchandise and boxes and things? The thief will never break into an abandoned warehouse. The shaitan is the thief in the analogy." He does not come to someone who doesn't believe in Allah and say, Oh, I don't think you believe in Allah. He comes to the one who believes in Allah. And that's why the Prophet said, the, re the, the fact that you found that is proof that you have iman. So don't let the shaitan put you in this crazy spiral, this circle of am I religious or not? You are a decent religious person because you are concerned with whether or not you're religious. All you have to do is just stop going in this circle, focus on improving your iman, improving your khushu', doing more good deeds, and not spend any more time on this question. So shaitan, by the way, knows a lot of psychology. Because, uh, why are you looking at Dr. Susie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, because, uh, and by the way, a lot of crooks know psychology. Con men, scammers, they know a lot of psychology. Pickpockets. You know, we know what a pickpocket does before they... They pick your pocket. They, like you're in a busy, crowded area, they bump into you first. And when someone bumps into you and you have money on you, what do you do subconsciously? You check on it. Even if he bumps you here, you check on it here. They bump you first, they see where you touch, and then that's what they go for. So there's a lot of psychology in crookedly, crookedry. And, uh, <laughs> so the shaitan knows some psychology, and he's just wasting your time with this nonsense. Don't spend any more time on this thought. It's not going to move you forward. It's just going to ho hold you backward. And just focus on improving yourself. All right? And uh, I'll just stop there. Actually, let me answer this one real quickly. This question says, I am from Sudan too. If you could only choose one, which are you picking? Fool or Grasa? <laughs> and of course, uh, I have to go with fool. I have to go with fool. Mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> All right, people. Dr. Lahir.
All right, so I think we're probably coming close to the end, or, okay. So uh, there's been a lot of questions here that I think maybe each of us could speak to as well, um, saying that there's a lot of non-Muslims that have joined us in the audience. And, you know, first of all, I want to say, you know, Jazakum Allahu Khair for joining us. Thank you. May Allah bless you and grant you barakah, nur, blessings in your lives. Um, being here in this room, coming to learn about a faith that maybe you don't practice, ask yourself why. Ask yourself what drew you here today. Was it curiosity? Was it interest? Was it an intention to debunk Islam? And Sheikh Kamel, mashallah, did a great job of guiding us through the thought process sometimes when people feel like, you know, I have to prove that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, was not a prophet and how to walk through that. But ask yourself honestly why. And if it was you were here because you're curious, because you hear about Islam in the media, you see it everywhere, you look at the, the depictions of what it means to be a Muslim and you have questions about it, then thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and meeting Muslim Americans, real life Muslim Americans living here, practicing their faith, because all of us who are here, who came to this room, intending to learn more about a faith that we do practice, every single one of us, I am sure, would love to talk about our faith, would love to share with you, would love to answer questions. So if you are curious, turn to the person next to you who may be a Muslim, exchange phone numbers if they're of the same gender, not if they're of the opposite gender. <laughs> exchange phone numbers, okay? Um, get whatever Snapchat handle or, or Be Real or whatever it is that you guys use these days, all right? Make a friend. <laughs> Don't leave here without making a friend because I guarantee you the best source of answers to your question is going to be a real life Muslim. Muslim. And if they don't have the answers, they will know who does. And it is not going to be Fox News, okay? So don't even go there. So if you're curious, definitely befriend someone. If you came here with the intention of wanting to debunk Islam and prove that it's wrong, know that Umar radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest khalifas um, who followed the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, actually intended to go to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to kill him prior to accepting Islam. And when he entered upon the Rasul, upon the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he heard the verses from the Quran, and those softened his heart. And he became one of the most prominent Muslims in, in Islamic history. So if you came here to debunk Islam, my sense is that you may have learned something. And I'll still tell you, take somebody's phone number, right? <laughs> Exchange information. Meet someone today. That's really my advice to the non-Muslims who are here. Meet someone, ask questions, keep learning, because this life is a journey towards learning. And again, one of the tenets of Islam is that we should continue to seek knowledge, even if it is far away as China. And here you have it at the University of Missouri. So I'll pause here and see if others have it. So I actually want to answer a different question. Inshallah, Sheikh Kamal can continue giving advice on that question. Uh, one of the questions was about advice. Another question here is, what are the must-read books for every single Muslima? So I wanted to make a point here, because I think this is probably going to be the last question that I'll be answering this evening, since our time is almost up, is that if I can just leave you with one thing, don't let this conference this weekend be the last step you take towards seeking sacred knowledge. Like, I beg you, don't. It's an obligation upon every Muslim to learn their deen. And we have a problem. Our problem is, is that mashallah, we're graduating with honors and going on to medical school, getting PhDs, but we don't know the basic fiqh of wudu. We never learned the fiqh of wudu. We never learned the basics of halal and haram. We don't know how to connect with Allah. We don't know how to connect with the Qur'an. That's a problem. And one of the tricks of shaitan is to make you so distracted with your worldly knowledge, which I'm not saying not to do. It's important. But you go 10 years through school, become a doctor, and you don't know which acts in wudu are fard and which are sunnah. 
And that's how shaitan gets us. So you might be saying, okay, that sounds good. I want to start where? Now, I don't know what Missouri has, but I do know a few institutions that I can vouch for. Number one, Qalam, Google Qalam Institute. I'm a student there. I've been a student there for a very long time. They have online programs. They have part-time and they have full-time. There's also Miftah Institute, Google them. They have a wonderful part-time online program for college students. That's two nights a week in the evening. The Wahid brothers are some of the most sincere people I've ever met. They are wonderful. And they're so entertaining. Like, I can sit there and listen to them forever. They have classes. There's also IOK, the Institute of Knowledge. They have online fiqh classes, online tafsir, online Arabic. Learn it, please. Like, don't, don't leave here this weekend without choosing one class that you're going to stick to. An online class, an in-person class. Learn the basics of your religion. Like a lot of us, we learned our prayer from our parents. May Allah reward them and bless them. But sometimes they didn't learn it from a reliable scholar, so they didn't learn it in its entirety correct. And so please make sure you, number one, number one action item is take a fiqh of wudu and salah class. It'll be such a tragedy to meet Allah on the Day of Judgment. Like one of the questions here, can you make wudu with makeup on? If we knew the fiqh of wudu, we wouldn't have to ask this question. Because one of the fara'id, one of the main obligations of wudu is that the water touches the places that are fard for the water to touch. And so if our makeup is waterproof and water cannot get through and it's on our face, which our face is one of the places that it's mandatory that the water touches, then our wudu would be invalid. So Learn the fiqh of wudu, learn the fiqh of salah according to one madhab, and stick to that. And then you won't get so confused when you hear, like one of the questions is, oh, I heard that halal meat is a must where Allah's name is mentioned, and then I heard from someone else that as long as it's not pork, this all comes down to fiqh. And if you learn fiqh in a structured way, you'll learn that because our deen is timeless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for differences of opinion. And so it won't confuse you when you learn that there are four major schools of thought in Islamic um, jurisprudence. And each one of them are correct. Each one of them go back to a different companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you learn usul al-fiqh, the way that the scholars of jurisprudence and Islamic law came up with their fiqh, it's mind-blowing. It's so sophisticated, so amazing. Even that in itself is a miracle. And the way that they have different proofs and which proof they start with and how they develop their usul, it's incredible. Learning this will not only deepen your love for the deen, but inshallah you can practice it with more confidence. And so, bare minimum fiqh, bare minimum aqidah, your beliefs. Sheikh was talking about how we fight over different, um, small, minor differences of opinion in our fiqh when we don't know our aqidah. We don't know what we believe. Imagine meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not knowing basic theology, what you believe in as a Muslim. So that, those are things that I'm going to leave you with. And I'm telling you, it might seem like it's difficult. It's not. I did it in college. I did it in college, and I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm not the most talented person in the world. After university, two nights a week, I used to go to the masjid, Sufa Islamic Seminary, took some classes. Learn your fara'id. There's also seekers guidance, which it's self-paced, it's online, it's completely free. You could choose two different tracks. They have a Shafi'i track and a Hanafi track, which is two different schools of thought. Just find one that's reputable. 
and just stick to it. The most beloved deeds to Allah are the consistent even if it's small. So even if it's just one class, one hour a week, and just stick to it. At least when you meet Allah, you can say, Allah, I tried. I tried to learn your deen. I tried to learn what I believe in. I tried to learn the basics. Insha'Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success and accept from us. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, I don't have much. Uh, basically, I just wanted to say I know there are a lot of questions, and my policy at these at conferences is that I'll uh, make myself as available as possible. So tomorrow I'm here all day from morning until night. Anywhere you catch me, f except the bathroom, feel free to ask me a question. <laughs> and the, the truth is, like some people, yeah, I have a heart. They see you walking into the stall. Sheikh, I have a question. Yeah, wait a minute. All right. So, huh? You forgot the lo lota. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it's fair game. Anywhere you see me except the restroom, feel free to ask me a question. I'll give whatever time I can to everybody. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, everyone who uh, you know, put so much effort to bring me here. And of course, may Allah reward Dr. Suzy Ismail and Sister Dunya Shaib, who is always on some airplane going somewhere around the world. May Allah accept from both of you and multiply your reward. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan to our speakers. Uh, like Sheikh Kamal said, uh, tomorrow we'll actually have an hour and 10 minute long Q&A session. Um, that'll be towards the end of the day, so stay tuned for that. Um, thank you for attending the first day of our program. Uh, we hope you benefited from the lectures and the Q&A. Uh, we have a quick few announcements before praying Aisha. Um, inshallah, we will begin at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Please bring your name tags. Um, since we do have a limited limited resources, um, and there was a lot of late registra registration people. Um, there's limited food, and we need your name tags to provide you that. Inshallah, there will be enough food for everyone, um, but the people with the name tags will be served first. Um, we will also provide babysitting to those people who registered their kids. Um, the kids have to be between 4 through 10, since we have limited room, um, and it will be from 10 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, Another announcement, make dua for Brother Abdul Munsif al-Buri. His condition is critical according to his family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him shifa. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan. We'll be praying Aisha. <laughs>